Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the DFK Australia New Zealand webinar, A Guide to Doing Business in Canada. Thank you for joining us today, where you're going to learn from Robert and John, talking you through what's involved in expanding your business into the beautiful Canada. So your host today is myself as a starting point. My name is Angela Raspus. But the people who have the expertise to share with you are Robert Shelton, who is from DFK's Everalls in Canberra. He's our managing director there. And John Grummet, who is joining us all the way from Hamilton in Canada, who's the tax partner at Taylor Lebo in that part of the world. Now, if you've not heard of DFK ANZ this morning, DFK Australia, New Zealand rather, shall I say, this is the first time that you've come across us and our work. We pride ourselves on local knowledge with firms in 14 offices around Australia and New Zealand. That's our national connections that then turn into global reach with 214 member firms around the world in 92 countries. So in addition to helping you move into new areas of opportunity for your business, we can also help you with due diligence, accounting, tax compliance, strategic planning, business valuation structures, all types of things. So we're certainly there for whatever you're looking to do in business growth. Now, the information that we're sharing with you on today's webinar has been prepared by Robert and John, and it's current as of today. But the material, we really need you to consider it as a summary rather than a comprehensive statement because your specific situation would need that individual advice. And there is so much speed of development in tax law. So the general summarized information that we're sharing here and any examples are pretty much for illustration only. But we certainly have an opportunity for you to dig down deeper with a consultation with us should you need it. And you can certainly get a good overview of what is in store for you when you're looking at expanding into Canada. So the subjects we'll be covering today is good old Canada 101, giving you that broad overview, looking at the different methods of how to carry on with a business in Canada, looking at branches, Canadian corporations, the concept of an unlimited liability corporation. We'll investigate partnerships and whether to work in your business with or without a PE, which is the permanent establishment status. We'll touch on withholding taxes on services, the GST and HST, transfer pricing and a few other issues that come along the way as well. So you'll be in very good hands. Now, I mentioned that there is a way of actually diving more deeply into the information you need about your own business. And that sign that's on the screen at the moment is a link that will take you through to booking yourself a Launchpad consultation. But let's move on to Canada 101. I shall hand over to the guys and talk with you again soon. Robert, over to you. Uh, thank you, Angela, and welcome, John. It's the middle of the night over there in Canada. It's the middle of the afternoon here. So thank you for taking time out of your bed to, um, uh, to join us in this conversation. Uh, welcome aboard. Thank um, you. Canada, Canada's a long way away from Australia, but it does have some things in common with us. There's a lot of land and a lot of it is sparsely inhabited. Um, and a lot of your people are uh, dotted along a very small space. But if you perhaps just to uh, make sure that we're on, the, on our uh, website here, on our webinar, everybody's on the uh, same basic understanding. Just walk us through how Canada is structured there and where do the people live? So uh, thank you, Robert. Canada is consisted of uh, 10 provinces and three territories, which would be similar to the states in Australia. And uh, um, about 90% of the Canadians live within 100 miles of the border of the US. So uh, you're going to see a lot of people live along the bottom of Canada and not so many live up in the uh, northern part of Canada. Uh, the northern part of Canada is very mineral rich and uh, the bottom part of Canada relies on trade with the US. So uh, uh, 17 out of the 20 largest cities in Canada are within 100 miles of the border. And we rely on exports to the US uh, significantly. Uh, one of the misnomers, I guess, is is that a lot of people think that Canada is is uh, everybody speaks English and French, but there are a number of people that speak, speak both languages, but uh, for the most part, you either speak English or French. 
Outstanding. So if we have a look at the next slide, Angela, the, um, those first couple of points that you've uh, made there are uh, on our slide, but to continue to then set a bit of a business picture for uh, Australian businesses that might be heading into Canada. Um, we're familiar in Australia with one federal income tax and we don't have to do income tax for each state and territory around the place. What's the situation and how does that work in Canada? Yeah, so Canada has both a federal tax rate and then each province has their own tax rate. Often the tax returns are filed together. You'd only file one income tax return, but it would include a federal tax and then the provincial taxes would be added on depending on where you're earning the income. So the income gets a portion to the various provinces based on, on where it's earned. And then in addition to that, we have a value added tax, which we'll talk about a little later. And then really the only local taxes are through property tax. Um, and then a couple of years ago, Toronto and Vancouver introduced a foreign buyer's tax for property because uh, foreign buyers were coming into those markets and inflating the, uh, the price of housing in, in those markets. So this was brought in probably two to three years ago. Uh, that sounds a bit familiar with some of the markets in Australia or the perceptions of some of the markets in Australia too. So, so it's a slightly more complex picture than what we're perhaps used to in Australia because there is a more active state tax regime. So we'll get our head around that as we go further through the uh, webinar. And of course, taxes are not the only thing. Before we can pay taxes, we're going to have to look at what um, business structure we might use in Canada. So on the next slide, we talk about um, three or four uh, different um, potential business structures that an Australian uh, corporation or Australian business person might choose to use. So let's just work through each of those and perhaps start with the branch operation, John. Yeah, so a branch operation is really where a foreign company comes into Canada. Um, they don't incorporate a new company in Canada. They don't uh, set up a partnership or anything like that. They merely come into Canada and start doing business in Canada through their their foreign corporation. So an Australian company comes into Canada, they just start doing business in Canada. And then the tax will depend on whether you're carrying on business in Canada with a permanent establishment or without a permanent establishment. If there's no permanent establishment, there's really no tax liability in Canada. Um, but you would still be required to file what we call a treaty-based return because it's under the Canada-Australia Treaty where it gets you out of paying tax in Canada if you don't have a permanent establishment. There still could be withholding tax issues without a permanent establishment. Uh, once you have a, a PE or a permanent establishment in Canada, then that foreign corporation would file a what's called a branch corporate tax return in Canada. And the tax rate there would be 26.5%, which is a 15% federal rate and 11 and a half in Ontario, where I'm from. You'll see in a couple slides where I break out what the uh, tax rates are in the various provinces, but they're all close to the 11 and a half, 12% uh, for the most part. Right, so a branch sounds like it might be an interesting business structure for an Australian business to set up in Canada. But one of the things that we've learned in looking at these webinars over uh, the last few seasons we've done them is that a branch also brings with it a bit of a downside in that the, there's no separation of risks if an Australian organisation sets itself up as a branch in Canada. Is that the same as we've learned on other webinars that if we just set up a branch of our business, a branch of our company perhaps in Canada, we might be exposing our Australian operations to Canadian risk and vice versa? Absolutely, uh, and and that's one of the reasons why, uh, depending on on, I, I guess the. Um surety of, of how the business is going to be operated, uh, we typically would recommend setting up a corporation uh, once you know you're going to be in Canada on a full-time basis. Unless, of course, you're, you're not going to have a permanent establishment. Maybe you're just merely going to sell to one or two customers in Canada and, you, and you're not really uh, what we would call carry on, carrying on business in Canada. You're really just selling a product into Canada. 
and in that case then then there's really not a need to set up a Canadian corporation but once you truly have operations in Canada it makes sense to set up the uh, Canadian corporation so that's probably a good segue to then move to the next of our potential business structures because with a corporation we can separate out our Canadian assets and Canadian risks from our Australian assets and Australian risks. So let's have a talk about how your corporations work in Canada and to kick off with, um, if I was to set up a Canadian corporation, um, uh, is it a federal company? Is it a a provincial company? Do I have to set up a separate company in every state? How does this work? No, so we have, uh, our, our corporations are very similar to the Australian corporations in that there's no flow through of income from the corporation. The income stays in the corporation and it gets taxed in the corporation. There is some integration where when dividends are taken out of the corporation, dividends are taxed at a lower rate than, than other income. Um, when you incorporate in Canada, you've got the option of either incorporating federally or you can incorporate in a specific province. If you incorporate federally, you can carry on business anywhere in Canada. If you incorporate in a province, for example, in Ontario, um, you would only be able to carry on in Ontario unless you register that company to carry on business in another province. So an Ontario corporation, for example, can carry on business all across Canada, but it would just have to register to do business in those other provinces. Um, and, and often we'll see, and we'll get to it, I guess, here in a minute around uh, non-residents coming into Canada. And one of the restrictions is around uh, the residency of directors. And we'll talk about that, I think, on the next slide. Yeah, so we might go to that next slide, but uh, just while we're waiting for that to come up, John, uh, presumably your firm would be able to give advice to webinar attendees as to where to have their business incorporated and which uh, province or which uh, or federally would be the best option for them, depending on the relevant circumstances. Yeah, yeah, it really depends on on uh, the facts of of how you're carrying on business and what kind of business you're carrying on. Um, quite often, we'll see a a company incorporate in in one of the provinces and then just register to do business in the other provinces as as they expand their operations. Cool. All right. But now you mentioned resident directors. In most countries, a company is required to have at least one resident director. You seem to have a mix of rules in Canada. Yeah. So it, again, it depends on where you've incorporated. And, and uh, I haven't listed all of the provinces here, but generally, um, you're required to have 25% of the directors must be resident in Canada. If you've got fewer than four directors, then uh, then at least one of them has to be resident in Canada. The only exception to that is if you incorporate in British Columbia, which is uh, the province on the most western edge of Canada, and uh, they don't require you to have uh, a resident director. So often we'll see if a foreign corporation is coming into Canada and, uh, and, and they don't have somebody here in Canada that's going to be a director, they'll incorporate in British Columbia. Uh, so that's something to be taken into account. Companies are a very, very popular structure for expanding internationally, isolating risks, uh, being careful around uh, separation of uh, both risks and assets in different uh, jurisdictions. But one of the important considerations is also income tax and your companies, as you say, are similar to Australian companies in that they're what us tax geeks call uh, closed corporations. The company itself pays tax, they're not a flow through entity. In some countries you have flow through companies, but we're not talking about that here. But let's go on to the next slide where we talk about your tax rates. And this is where it gets a little more complex because each uh, province has the ability to levy its own company tax. So that's the guts of it on the slide there. Is it, uh, John, that's for the, the core that we need to know? Yeah, so you'll you'll see on the slide at the top, the federal rate is 15%, and then each province has a different rate. 
um, a lot of the provinces uh, just integrate into a schedule on the feder federal return where the tax is calculated. But there are some of the provinces where you actually file a separate return. Uh, for example, Quebec is one of those uh, provinces where you file a separate return. And uh, the interesting thing with Quebec is, is you actually have to file it in French as well. So uh, when we prepare the returns, we obviously prepare them in English and then uh, uh, the software does its magic and, and we send it in in French. <laughs> very, very exciting for you. Um, and, and just as an aside, as, as an accountant uh, located in uh, Ontario there, um, are you licensed or registered or able to provide advice in all the other states and provinces, I should say, all the other provinces of Canada, or is it very localised? No, no, we can assist in all of the other provinces. Sometimes you get something very specific in another province and, you know, with our DFK affiliates all across Canada, if there's something specific that, that we're not familiar with, we'd certainly reach out to one of those other provinces. But uh, for the most part, we, we, uh, we have clients all across Canada, even though it's a vast country, we've got uh, clients everywhere in the country and, and uh, we, we can file tax returns. Uh, for any of those provinces. Uh, excellent. All right. So having looked at a branch and a uh, company, corporation, as a potential structure for setting up business in uh, Canada, the next option would be to look at a partnership. This is probably less attractive for most foreign uh, businesses to use. Again, separation of risks and liabilities. But just talk us through your Canadian aspects of forming a partnership there. Yeah, so a partnership, the, the one consideration here is in order to have a partnership, you need to have two partners. And so that is, is one thing that, that uh, sometimes restricts a partnership. And then the other is that uh, the income of the partnership flows through to the individual partners. So if you had, uh, uh, let's say, three, three partners from Australia that wanted to form a partnership in Canada, each of those Australian uh, entities would end up filing a tax return in Canada to report that income. Um, the other thing that you run into with a partnership is as soon as you have one foreign partner, that partnership is considered to be a foreign entity. And as a result, you run into a lot of withholding tax issues uh, with partnerships. So as a result, we don't see them as often with a foreign entity coming into Canada as uh, we would some of the other structures. We do have a uh, uh, limited partnership in Canada, which helps to limit some of the liability, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't lim limit it all. So so again, with the withholding tax issues and the and the compliance issues, usually the partnership is not uh, something that is is that common. All right, so we'll move on from that pretty quickly then, I suspect. Now, let's move on then to, um, you've made reference to a permanent establishment or PE as our nice little acronym is. Um, and the concept of permanent establishment um, has some extra weight in Canada, perhaps uh, compared to some places. Um, we'll come to that shortly. But if you just want to walk us through here, the tests um, very briefly on what is a permanent establishment, we're not going to go into great detail. And for the benefit of webinar listeners, um, there are webinars that run for hours and even days for tax geeks to uh, look at permanent establishment issues. We're not going to do that. We're going to do this in two minutes flat. So, John, what's the story? <laughs> yeah, so so um, if you don't have a permanent establishment in Canada, as I said before, uh, you're not taxed in Canada on those profits. Um, the, the simple example of, a permanent, of not having a permanent establishment would be where you're simply selling into Canada and you don't have any salesmen in Canada. Uh, you, you've got one, maybe two customers in Canada and you're selling a product into Canada. In that case, you wouldn't have a permanent establishment. The, the common things that create a permanent establishment would obviously be an office or a warehouse or, uh, you know, if you've got a construction site that uh, you're, you're constructing maybe a uh, an office tower and that construction project's going to carry on more than 12 months that would constitute a permanent establishment 
The other thing that that constitutes a PE is is if you hire an independent contractor in Canada, that alone doesn't create a permanent establishment. But if you give that independent contractor the ability to conclude contracts on your behalf in Canada, then it does. So if you're going to have an independent contractor in Canada, uh, we generally suggest that any contracts are approved in Australia rather than approved in Canada. And then uh, another criteria is if you, you are providing services in Canada and those services extend beyond 183 days on the same project, that would constitute a PE. Uh, some of the things that don't, you may have a third party warehouse, so you're shipping inventory into Canada into a third party warehouse, but that uh, third party warehouse, there's no salesman or anything like that there. They're simply storing your goods and then you're fulfilling the orders. Uh, that on itself wouldn't constitute a PE. And then, as I said before, if an agent doesn't have the ability to conclude contracts, um, it's not a PE. And and also, if you've got a just a subsidiary corporation, you incorporate a company in Canada, that doesn't necessarily give your Australian company a permanent establishment, but the Canadian company certainly would. Yeah. So this is an area where um, you know, webinar attendees, uh, businesses looking to expand into Canada, really it is something that their advice should be sought. And if we just go over to the next page, there's probably twice as much uh, risk in this space compared to perhaps some other countries, because you've got some withholding taxes on um, services revenue and for cross-border activities in this concept that is a little more aggressive than perhaps we have elsewhere. So just walk us through what this withholding tax is on services. How does that work, John? Yeah, so we've got two regulations I refer to there on the slide, Regulation 105 and 102. And what Regulation 105 is, is, is if a foreign company, so an Australian company, is coming into Canada to provide services. So Rob, let's say you come into Canada and you're providing IT services to a Canadian customer. That Canadian customer, because the services are rendered in Canada, they must withhold 15% on any payments going outside the country to you. Um, so that's what Regulation 105 is. It's for services provided in Canada. So if it was IT services that you were providing from Australia, that's okay, it's not subject to withholding. It's when your people come into Canada and are providing services, you have to, the, the customer has to withhold. So you can imagine a, a customer coming into Canada, uh, bidding on a contract, getting the contract, they start providing the services, and all of a sudden they find out they're only getting 85% of their revenue instead of 100%, it can create a lot of problems. So it's the a regulation. A one, no, sorry, it's, sorry, before we move on, it's, it's a bit of a trap for the unwary on that one. Um, as you say, uh, if you're only getting 85% of your invoice value and the rest of it's been uh, paid to the Canadian tax authorities, uh, that could create some tax. Uh, some cash flow difficulties for some businesses and it also means that um, for many businesses you know 15% is uh, in some cases all of their net profit margin or more so uh, something really to be aware of and make sure that the process for doing that has been worked into the pricing and the ability to go and reclaim it from the revenue authorities. That's right. Often yeah, you point. can get it back if you don't have a permanent establishment in Canada, but uh, it's it's a cash flow issue in that it may take you, uh, you know, up to eighteen months to get it back. So it, it becomes a significant issue. And then uh, re regulation one hundred and two. It's it's uh, on the payroll side. So, so again, in that example where you're sending your employees into Canada, they're providing services in Canada. Not only does the customer have to withhold the 15% on the payment for services, but now if your employees are in Canada over a certain length of time, the foreign company has to register for payroll deductions in Canada for those foreign employees. And that's what Regulation 102 is. So uh, uh, the, it, there's a big issue with service providers coming into Canada. Not that it's, it's insurmountable to deal with, but often we find people come into Canada, they start carrying on business by providing services. 
and then they find out when the auditors uh, start stop at their door and ask for money under regulation 102 and 105 it creates a lot of issues yeah so expanding into canada might be a fantastic market and a great place to uh, sell your services and to do business but uh our webinar attendees are now aware of just a couple of traps that they need to navigate through and get some good advice around. So um, very worthwhile having those little pointers in there so we don't make expensive mistakes. So we're still talking about tax. We'll talk about some other things uh, a bit later on. But if we just go over to, you've got GST, which is a, a, an acronym that we're well familiar with in Australia, but you've also got a thing called an HST. Now, when I was growing up, that stood for high speed train which has been talked about in Australia for the last 50 years, but um, uh, still there isn't one. But I don't think that's what we're talking about here, John. No, no, and you'll see in the heading there, I say GST and HST, the same tax with a different name. And that's exactly what it is. So the GST is the federal value added tax. It stands for goods and services tax. A number of years ago, the provinces all had their own individual sales tax. And a number of the provinces, especially some of the smaller ones, thought it was ridiculous that they were administering their own sales tax. So they harmonized with the federal government. And they said, rather than us having a, a, a provincial sales tax, which is added on the top of the goods and services tax, we're going to harmonize our tax with the federal system. And, uh, and, and they've called it a harmonized sales tax. So it, it has the, it's the exact same rules as, as the GST, it's just it's a different rate. The GST is a 5% tax, the HST is a different rate depending on what province you're in. And a little, in a little bit I'll show you a map that uh, talks about what the rates are in the various provinces. Well, let's go to the map now, um, and which is over on the next slide there. Um, and you can just talk us through very briefly what those uh, different rates are. And you've got the three acronyms on the page there, GST, PST, and HST. And, and there's a fourth one, QST. Ah. <laughs> so, so you'll see in, in the territories, which are up in the northern part of the country, Nunavut, Northwest Territories, the Yukon, and then Alberta, which is on the... the almost on the west coast, it's just a 5% GST. So those areas that are in sort of that medium blue color are only the 5% GST. Then you'll see on the far west coast, we've got British Columbia, it's got a 5% GST, but they still have their own provincial sales tax. So they've got a 7% PST. And then as you go through the other province, you'll see Albert, or, uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, they both have a GST and a PST, different rates. Then when we get into Ontario, Ontario is harmonized. So it's got a 13% HST. Then we go to Quebec. Quebec is a little bit different. They've got the 5% GST. And instead of calling their provincial sales tax PST, they call it QST for Quebec sales tax. And then the four provinces on the East Coast, which we refer to as the Maritime Provinces, they're all HST as well, but they're a 15% HST. So you'll see Ontario's a 13% HST, whereas the Maritime Provinces are 15% HST. All of the GST and HST are, is administered by the federal government. The provincial ah. sales taxes are administered by the individual provinces. So does that mean we might have to lodge two GST, PST type tax returns, one with the state or, ter sorry, one with each province and one with uh, the feds if we're doing business in multiple states or um, how does that work in practice? No, no. If, if, uh, if you're carrying on business in a number of different provinces, you're going to file one GST, HST return, but some of the GST might be collected at 5% and some of it might be collected at 13%. Uh, so for example, with our customers, the majority of them are in Ontario, we charge a 13% HST, but we do have a couple of customers out in Alberta, and in Alberta, we only charge them 5%. If we're doing work for somebody that's outside of the country, those are zero rated, so we don't charge any HST on those. 
Right, yep. So it's a little more complex than uh, we're probably used to here in Australia. We've got one GST, it's at the federal level, there's no state or province uh, GST issues. So that's cool. If we just go back to the previous slide though, there are some uh, little uh, notes that we probably should be aware of. And the first one we'll dispense with pretty quickly. There's a $30,000 threshold, uh, and that would be Canadian dollars, of course. But presumably, if you're an Australian business looking to do business in uh, Canada, you wouldn't be going over there with the aim of trying to stay under $30,000. The costs of compliance and the costs of getting set up properly would be way more than what it's worth. So that low um, small threshold is probably really of no uh, practical relevance for Australian businesses expanding. Would I be right in that thinking, John? That, that's right. And that's 30000 of sales, not 30000 of GST or HST. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So not much there. So then there's a few issues as usual with uh, importations and with foreign corporations, whether they're doing business in Canada. Do you want to just quickly walk us through those, maybe perhaps a minute on that? Yeah, yeah. So, so the second bullet point there, the product imported into Canada. When product is imported into Canada, the GST has to be paid at the border. And it's just a matter of who is the importer of record. That person pays the GST or HST at the border. And, and so if, if you've got an Australian company selling product into Canada, that Australian company may be the importer of record. And if they are, they have to register for GST or HST. But it may be that your customer is the importer of record. So if you don't have any operations in Canada, you're simply selling to a customer in Canada. Uh, the customer may be the importer of record, and then they're going to pay the GST or HST. Um, a foreign corporation, if it's doing business in Canada, it has to register uh, for GST or HST. Um, and doing business in Canada is a bit of a subjective test, but we typically recommend that if you're doing any sort of activity in Canada, you probably want to register for GST and HST because um, you know, your customers aren't going to really care because if they pay the GST or HST, generally they're going to get it back. So, so they don't really care and uh, it's better to register and, and be on side than to uh, try and argue that you're not doing business in Canada unless it's clear cut. Okay, and a Canadian corporation, or if you've got a permanent establishment in Canada, then you're definitely required to register because you're definitely seen to be carrying on business. Yeah, once, once again, it's one of those areas where if you're not sure, get some advice um, and talk to our DFK uh, firms in Canada, talk to you and you know, make sure that you're not making a, an expensive mistake um, or something that's gonna cause you grief later on down the track. Best advice right. is always the advice received in advance to get it right in advance. Um, so in looking at doing business in Canada, um, the last are sort of the, uh, the technical issues that we're going to go through in any detail, and we're not going to do much detail on it, it's on the next slide, it talks about transfer pricing. Um, and that might be a topic that is pretty uh, clear to business people that have been doing business internationally. But for some people who are just starting out on their international trading journey, um, again, transfer pricing, you and I have sent, spent days sitting in DFK tax webinars and conferences looking at this. We're not going to spend days today. Um, our webinar is uh, limited in how much time we have, and that's probably a good thing. But uh, John, at a very high level, what is transfer pricing and why do we have to be worried about it? Transfer pricing is, is uh, the um, price you're charging a related party in another country for either the products or services that, that are going across the border. And uh, they're, they're just trying to make sure that the profits are in the right country. And um, in Canada, there's a, a uh, form you're to file with your corporate tax return where you've got transactions over a million dollars with a related non-resident. And once you have to file that form, then there's a, a requirement to have what they call contemporaneous documentation. And uh, that's really documentation on hand at the time you file your tax return that supports how you come up with those arm's length prices. And uh, one of the biggest things we find with, with uh, dealing with companies from outside of Canada is what I refer to here as the expectation gap. 
uh, their their concept of what uh, contemporaneous documentation is is sometimes very different than what Revenue Canada is looking for. Yes, it's a, again a trap to the unwary. Um, and the risk here for our uh, webinar attendees, um, people thinking of doing business anywhere in the world really, but Canada is a, a standard example of it, is you might think, well, I'll just arrange my pricing and servicing so that I bring all profits back to Australia, then I don't have to worry about Canadian tax. Obviously, the Canadian revenue authorities would be concerned about that. The Australian tax authorities probably are going, yippee, this is cool. Um, but equally, the opposite might also apply. You might say, well, hey, the Canadian federal uh, company tax rate and even the provincial tax rate is a bit less than the Australian corporate tax rate. So what we'll do is we'll leave all our profits in Canada, um, in which case the Australian tax authorities may get a little bit upset. So you actually have a risk on both sides of the pond um, as to how you're doing your pricing and shifting profits. And that's why the uh, transfer pricing rules gives you the ability to get some of the decisions clear, your contemporaneous documentation to allocate profit correctly between the two countries, such that both tax, both tax authorities might be reasonably comfortable. Is that a good summary? You agree with that, John? Yeah, and, and uh, that's a, a great summary. And one of the other things just to, to keep in mind is, is if there is a transfer pricing audit and, and audit adjustments because your transfer pricing wasn't correct, is sometimes those can be one-sided adjustments as well. And then you really end up with a double tax. So, so you want to try to avoid that if at all possible. Yes, you don't want those sorts of issues. All right, so let us move on from transfer pricing because we could get uh, down that particular uh, topic for the next uh, eight hours and none of us want to do that and you're probably in need of some sleep. Um, so let's talk about some other issues and uh, doing business in Canada still looks like a fairly attractive option if we have the right product and sales mix, but there's some other issues that can just trip us up along the way here. Do you want to just talk about these other issues for a moment, uh, John? Yeah, so the, the first one there, the cross-border loans, if if you've got a a loan across the border, uh, Canada, if, if Canada has loaned it to Australia, Canada requires an interest rate to be charged on that loan. And if it's going the other way, where it's going from Australia to Canada, uh, there are some rules whereby that loan could be treated as a dividend if it's outstanding. Uh, more than two years. So you want to be careful on those cross-border loans to make sure, uh, number one, there's interest where there should be, and number two, that uh, you don't run into them being treated as a dividend. And then uh, the, the second bullet point there, thin capitalization. If you've got an Australian company coming into Canada and that Australian company is going to loan money to a Can Canadian subsidiary, the interest that that Canadian subsidiary pays to Australia may be uh, restricted if, if your debt to equity is less than 1.5 to 1. So there's some fairly technical points in there, um, but it is very common for an Australian business expanding into Canada to uh, loan a lot of money into the uh, you know, foreign subsidiary, the Canadian subsidiary. Um, and frequently these loans, when it is related businesses, um, uh, don't carry any interest and people don't document them and all those sorts of things. But that just sets up a whole lot of grenades ready to um, trip you up later on uh, from what you've just been saying. So again, some great warning tips there for people thinking of going into Canada um, and doing business there. Got to, got to get your house in order and make sure that you've structured the financing of the startup period particularly appropriately. Not That's going to right. pay a lot more attention to that, but thank you. That's helpful. Um, we've mentioned withholding taxes a number of times along the way. Um, you've got a table there of the withholding taxes under our double tax agreement. Not going to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, we might just move on to uh, the next slide there. Uh, thanks, Angela. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there is a whole lot of tax rates that you've got on here, uh, John, and this looks like a very complex slide. Um, what is this? So, so this is the the personal tax rates for an individual living in Ontario. So, so we have a graduated tax rate for individuals, and. Uh, and the graduated tax rate obviously starts off with a low rate and it goes up to a high rate. 
And so if you look at the first column there that says other income, um, the high, high tax rate on other income, anything over $220,000, you pay 53.53% tax on that. So it's not on, as soon as you go over 220,000, it's only everything over the 220 that you pay the high rate on, but you pay a graduated rate, as you can see up above that on everything up to 220,000. That's a very Canada. complex, very complex uh, tax scale. You've got what eight or nine or ten different rates there. In Australia, we've got like four. Yeah, and and each province is a little bit different, um, but but <laughs> Ontario has has a number of different rates, and and then uh, what you'll find is in Canada, uh, you'll see the capital gains rate there in the next column is exactly half of the first column. And the reason for that is, is uh, capital gains, only half of a capital gain is subject to tax. So if you, if you uh, let's say, bought a, a piece of uh, real estate in Canada and uh, you paid $100,000 for it and, and three years later it's gone up to 300000 you sell it, you've got a $200,000 gain. Only a hundred thousand of that gain is subject to tax, so that's why the tax rate for for capital gains is half of that for individuals, and that's the same with a corporation and an individual. Capital gains, no matter who uh, earns that capital gain, only half of it is subject to tax. Wow! All right, so complex arrangements. We put that slide in just so that people can see something different. Um, these are the rates that are applicable to Ontario resident taxpayers, uh, presumably. John, right. are non-residents given different rates? Well, yeah. If the non-resident is is uh, earning income from a province, they will pay. Uh, let's say they were earning it from Ontario. This is the rate they would pay. If uh, if the non-resident is is earning income from Canada, but it's not in a province, then uh, they pay a federal surtax. So the federal surtax is 48% of the federal tax. So the high federal tax rate is about 33%. And so you add another 48% of the 33% on. So you're up pretty close to 50%. Wow. All right. So um, let's move on to the next slide, which is just giving people a, a bit of a guideline as to what are the uh, maximum worst case rates. Um, and then, yeah, you guys take more than half occasionally. Yeah, so these are the top rates. So if you look there at Ontario, the 53.53%, if you went back to the previous slide, you, you see down at the bottom of it that that uh, Ontario's top rate on, on uh, salaries or interest is the 53.53. So you'll see that most of the provinces are are uh, up close to 50% or over 50%. Yeah, if you want yeah. to want a tax break, you want to move to Nunavut. <laughs> you might even get a bit colder, though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Um, so on the next slide, we're going to talk about uh, incentives, I think, is uh, where we get up to. But before we do that, I wondered if we might just divert sideways for a moment and just talk about um, whether our uh, foreign-owned Canadian corporations, so we've decided to set up a corporation in Canada, it's owned by an Australian business or an Australian individual, does that Canadian corporation have to be audited? No. Um, the the audit requirements in Canada are uh, once you exceed a certain size, there is an audit requirement, but you can waive it, and and it's very easy. It's just a director's resolution to waive the audit requirement. The only companies in Canada that are mandatory required are uh, publicly traded entities, and uh, sometimes you'll find uh, the bank wants wants the uh, financial statements to be audited but it is not a requirement uh, uh, under law to have the audit done. 
Mm, so that's a bit more relaxed than our laws where once you hit a certain size, you have to be audited. So, so that's kind of comforting and cool. And the other question that I had is, um, you know, if, if we're still excited, despite the tax regimes and all the rest of it, but we're still excited that there's a great opportunity to do business in Canada and we're going to get our structure set up, how easy is it then for a foreigner to open a bank account? Yeah, and it's it's difficult to open a bank account in Canada. In Canada, we have we have um, a number of of what we call chartered banks, and and there's about there used to be six, but there's probably about ten or twelve now. And uh, you would typically have to be in Canada personally and go into the branch to to uh, open a bank account. They're going to want to see your incorporation documents. Um, if you don't have a corporation in Canada, there may be other documents they're going to need to prove that that uh, you're allowed to open an account in Canada. Yes, so as in most of the uh, webinars that we've been doing, personal attendance, if you want to open a bank account for your corporation or even for yourself in the foreign country, Pretty much you're going to have to get on the aeroplane and go and turn up in person and wet sign as the, we like to call it the um, the relevant documentations and proof of identity and so forth um, so something just to bear in mind um, with all the anti-money laundering rules and so forth there are now um, the banks really do want to eyeball who it is they're setting up their bank accounts for all right so that was a whole lot of um, uh, practical information and structural information um, there's some good incentives to go and do business in Canada, besides the fact that it's obviously full of very nice people to do business with. What are these incentives that you've got listed on the next on, on this slide here? Yeah, so the first there is scientific research and experimental development, and, and there's some very uh, good incentives to carry on R&D in Canada. Um, there, there's two different uh, regimes. One is if you're a, a non-Canadian controlled company and the other is if you're a Canadian controlled private corporation and the incentives are higher for the Canadian controlled private corporation so for example if you're having an Australian company coming into Canada but you maybe had somebody in Canada that you're going to do business with if that Canadian entity owned 50 percent or more of the shares then it may be considered Canadian controlled and then there's a lower tax rate for Canadian controlled private corporations on, on the first $500,000 of profits. A couple other incentives that I, I didn't put on this slide that I thought of after is, is there are some incentives in the mining industry as well. Uh, typically we see those out in the western part of Canada, uh, mining and oil and gas. And then uh, the other thing we're seeing more and more of now is there is uh, film credit incentives. So if you are going to uh, make a movie, um, you want to come into Canada to make that movie because there's some significant incentives. And we're seeing more and more uh, uh, companies from Hollywood um, coming into Canada to make films because of the incentives. I think Australia likes to do that too, but we've got the disadvantage that you can't just drive over the border. <laughs> um, but yes, we have all sorts of good film incentives uh, buried away in our tax law as well. But yes, useful to know that those things exist. All right, so I think with that, Angela, we can move on to the next slide, which I think is uh, coming towards an end. And we're probably running just a fraction early, but that's good. Um, I'm going to say thank you to John for uh, the input so far. And we'll just see if there's any questions from the webinar attendees. And I'm just checking the question box at the moment. Uh, no, there's no questions that have come through. So I think we are answering the ones that were in people's heads before they were listening. I'll just pause for a sec. Um, those of you that are on the line live at the moment, you are able to type into the question box if there is something that you would like to ask. If not, as often happens when you're taking in this type of information, sometimes we need some time to ponder and digest it. You will receive a copy of the slide deck and also of the recording. And there is also, on top of that, a guide to doing business in Canada PDF that we'll, we'll be sending through by email. So as you're going through those and having a look and re-listen to what you've been exposed to today, if a question does come up, we would welcome 
the opportunity to help you with that and to hear from you. Now, maybe that you simply need to email us with something simple, or if you're wanting to dig deeper, we do have the Launchpad consultation that is a part of all of our Doing Business Overseas webinars. This is where you can have a private consultation where we can help you scope your expansion opportunity into Canada or one of the other countries that we've covered in this series. We can help you ascertain those next steps to take that are right for you and your specific situation and also uncover the questions that you need to ask. It's not always easy to know what it is that you need to know when it's a brand new business venture. Now it's just $3.95 plus GST to have one of these consultations and the link there will also come out to you in the email and you'd be most welcome to spend some time with us. So just the last reiterations here is that the DFK ANZ firms can help not only with this type of expansion and structure, but many other aspects of your business growth overall, from strategic planning right through to tax planning, bookkeeping, coaching, and all the pieces in between. So we do very much hope that you've um, received the information you are looking for in today's webinar. Now, this Doing Business Overseas series for, not, for 2019 has already covered Malaysia and India, and we'll be covering Germany next week with another expert from one of our overseas offices. So thank you so much to Rob and to John for spending his time here with us this evening, and to you, our listeners, for investing your time with us. So this has been a guide to doing business in Canada. We will stay in touch to let you know of more webinars coming up, not only in this series, but also in our Better Business webinar series with our monthly webinars. The one that's coming up next month will also be highlighted for you in the information that comes around. I do believe it is succession planning, a really important piece for anyone that is in business for the long haul. So again, thank you for your time. Take care and we'll be back again with some more information for you shortly.